his word. Love him today. I hope and you do. I know that he died for my sin. You know why? Because that's all that's going to matter one of these days. There's still all that's hard matter. times Woo! in this life of mine. Yes, amen. Anyway. I'm glad I'm we saved today, ain't you? To hear Hallelujah. Not going to hell. Again. Hallelujah. Amen. How that Jesus came down to man. Come on, man. Come on, shed man. his blood Come and on. died for thee. Sure. Tell me how he rose from the Come on, grave. Oh, tell me the story. Yes. Of the king of all. your heart. Listen now. Listen now. God's only begotten is sometimes forgotten sure. when things seem to go our way. Yeah, man. More I am finding Listen. that I need reminding what a blessing. just what he did Woo! on that Oh, that's good. Man, that's good singing. Come on. How he suffered pain and agony. Think about that. On a hill Think about what he went Calvary. through for you. Think about oh, what he went through for you. Because he loves love me. Hallelujah. Turn it up now. Ready? Oh, oh well, tell me boy. That story. Tell me that story. Think about that this morning. We're not here on Sunday morning just because it's a Sunday morning thing to do. I feel sorry for people that just say, well, it's Sunday, let's go to church and get it over with. I, I'd just stay home if I didn't believe in the Lord no more than that. I mean, listen, we, it's things real. This is real. There really is a heaven. We're not going to hell. This is real today. Not just something somebody made up. He's here today while we worship Him. Lord, in mercy, I don't shut up. I'm going to go ahead and preach right now. Isn't it good? It's good to be saved. I'm glad I'm saved. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Ready? Oh, tell me the story. Come on, say. Oh, glory. And lay down His life for me. Isn't that something? Oh, if that ever gets a hold of you, you'll shout your soul. Good man. Oh, how he blesses. I think I'd like to hear it again. Tell me the story. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand while they come down. Turn around there. Shake somebody's hand again. The ushers are coming. Amen. Be friendly. Be friendly there to the Lord. Be friendly. Tell somebody that old story this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right, now, let's uh, honor the Lord this morning uh, with our giving. I hope that you will. And uh, as I said, uh, it'd help a couple more gifts on the kids' Christmas presents. That'd be a blessing if you could do something special with that today. Let me know after church, or you can go ahead and give it now and let me know. That'd be a blessing too. What a blessing it is to be able to help somebody. 
Um, there's, I can think of one right now. Um, no place to live because parents going through a separation and divorce. Uh, three kids done applied to DSS and they told them it was too late. Three kids getting nothing except what our church gets them. And just there's story after story after story like that. And so it's good to be a blessing to somebody, be a help to somebody. And uh, it's not the kids' fault. It's probably the parents, but not the kids. So let's, uh, let's do something for the Lord this morning. Everybody give faithfully, honor God, and He'll bless you for it. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Pray now that you would bless this offering. Let it be what you want it to be. Meet the need, God, of our church. And Lord, bless the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Get your Bibles out and settle down there for a minute. Um, while you're getting your Bibles out, turn to John chapter 1, the book of John chapter 1, the gospel of John. While you're doing that, let me refresh and go over with you again next Sunday. And uh, we'll be having bus workers and Sunday school teachers meeting tonight to, dis to uh, discuss our plans for next Sunday. It's going to be a very special day being Christmas. Um, uh, you only have Christmas on Sunday about every six or seven years, so it's not going to kill you to come to church. Uh, if you're a Christian, you ought to say, this is the birthday of the Savior. My goodness, there's any, if there's one day a year you ought to go to church, it ought to be on Christmas. And, you, and you'll still get home plenty of time to open them two gifts you get Matter of fact, you can open before you come to church. I, I would have mine open and done when I was little before it got daylight. We'd have had them tore up by the time to come to church when we was little, wouldn't you? So uh, one fellow got his kids an anvil for Christmas. Can you hear that ringing, brother? Um, and they done had it tore up. John chapter 1. John chapter number 1 this morning. Now we'll meet next Sunday morning. And we're going to have a short Sunday school, start the preaching service early, get you out of here early, early, early. About this time next week, should be getting out. And that way, you'll uh, uh, be able to go if you're supposed to meet your family for lunch or whatever. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Let's look at this scripture here this morning. In the beginning, verse 1, was the Word, and the Word, capital W. Just turn this, this one off, and my monitor is something down on this one, but Mike. Let's start all over. Let's try that again. Verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. 
That's a capital W. Jesus Christ. Isn't that a strange thing to call Jesus a word? Of all the things to call God's Son a word, call Him a word. What is a word? A word is something that I say out of my mouth or it's something that you write on a piece of paper. And the Word was with God. And look at this. The Word was God. If anybody ever tries to tell you Jesus wasn't God, there's a simple verse of Scripture. The only way they couldn't believe that is to have a preconceived notion that He's not and change that verse. You just let the Bible say what it said. Jesus Christ is God. The Word was God. Verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. God made them by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse number 14. And the Word, capital W, was made flesh, that's Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us. You know what that means right there? Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want to preach for a few minutes this morning on the Word made flesh. This may not be what you would consider a Christmas message, but it definitely is to me, because I'm going to give you this morning a comparison of the living Word, Jesus Christ, and the written Word, the Bible. Now, I don't know if you understand this or not, but this Bible this morning is a written form of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came into this world, it was the Word of God in flesh. So Jesus and the Bible are one and the same. This is the written Word. He is the living Word. When I talk to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm talking to the living Word. When I read this, I'm reading the written word. The written word and the living word are always agreeable. They never contradict each other. Now, I want to say, if you don't know one, you don't know the other. If you don't know the Bible, you don't know much about Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't know much about the Bible. Uh, some, of these, some of these so-called, quote, religion courses they give you in schools are nothing more than lost people's view of the Bible and if you're not careful, you'll wind up doubting the Scripture more than you will believing it. Because if you don't know the living Word, you can't understand the written Word. Um, I heard about a woman years ago who was reading a book. Somebody gave her a book and she read it. Back before TV came out, people read books. And they, they, um, she was reading this book and she said, this is the most boring, dull book I've read in many a day. And then it wasn't long after that that she was introduced to some friends somewhere. She met a man, fell in love with him, began, and she said, your name is in this book. He said, that's because I'm the author of that book. She said, you're kidding. You wrote that? She went home that night and stayed up all night reading that book. You know why? She knew and loved the author. The Bible is a dead, dull, boring book until you know the author. And when you meet the author, man, when I got saved, first thing I wanted to do was stick my nose in the ear and say, this is the, uh, that one that got in me the other night and saved me. He wrote this. So I'm going to see what it said. And it started, it started clicking, the one that's in me and the one that's written here in this book. It makes a difference when you know and love the author. Now, this is going to be a little study here for a minute. So I want you to give me your attention. Let me give you a comparison. Number one, Jesus has two natures. Human and divine. Clearly, he was the son of God and clearly he was the son of man. He has two natures. He has a human nature. He has a divine nature. He is a little baby in Bethlehem. There he was, a little baby. Human as me and you. Flesh and bones, blood, heart, lungs, ears, eyes, brain, just like me and you have. But he had a divine nature also. He's the only man that's ever had that like he did. He was human and yet he was divine. As God, he gave living water. But as a man, he turned water 
in, uh, as man, uh, uh, God in the water and the wine there at, at, the, at the wedding. As God, He gave living water. He was, as a man, He went to a wedding. As God, or uh, as a man, He slept in a boat. But as God, He woke up and told the storm to lay down and the waves to quit blowing, uh, blowing, the, uh, blowing by the wind. As a man, He was tempted. But as God, He sinned not and resisted all the temptation. Ladies and gentlemen, there's never been nobody else like that. He was both God and man. Two individuals in one personality. As a man, he thirsted. But as God, he gave living water. As a man, uh, he, he wept. But as God, he raised Lazarus from the dead. There, it's like You can see both natures operating in the life of the Lord Jesus. As a man, he prayed. But as God, he can make intercession to God for us in, in our prayers. This is what Paul meant when he said, Great is the mystery of godliness. Jesus Christ, my friends, was a man, but he was God in a man. He was God manifest in flesh. He was God but man. Let me get this clear. He was not half God and half man. He was all God and all man. At the same time. You say, I can't understand that. It's a mystery. It's a mystery we can't comprehend. But we believe by faith that Jesus Christ was God and man. He was God of very God and man of very, very man. According to his, uh, his lineage, he was born in Bethlehem of the seed of Abraham, the son of David, the son of Mary, the son of God. He was acknowledged as the king of the Jews, Christ the Lord, God's son, savior of men, by angels, demons, shepherds, and wise men. He received tribute of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But as a man, he labored as a carpenter, opened the eyes of the blind as God, unstopped deaf ears as God, loose dumb tongues as God, cleansed lepers as God, healed the sick as God, restored withered hands, fed the hungry, sympathized with the, uh, with the sad, uh, walked in the disciple, uh, uh, shoes and washed their feet, wept with Mary and Martha, preached the gospel to the poor. He was born of a woman, but he was God in the flesh. He had two natures, divine and human. Now the Bible also has two natures, divine and human. Do you realize that's the only book in the world that has two natures, divine and human? Just like Jesus was God and man, the Bible it has two natures, human and divine. God did not drop the Bible out of the sky and say, here, read it. Men, the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that means it was man, hand, and God's thoughts. I'll never forget Brother Ed Maccabee put it like this. Best in, definite inspiration I've ever heard. He said, the Holy Ghost got a hold of the head and the heart and the hand of those men. It wasn't like they went into a trance and it was just dictated like that and it was out of their control. God allowed their humanity to come through. You hear people say all the time, say, well, man wrote the Bible. That's true, but God wrote it too. God used the hand of man to write his word. So there's a human element. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul over there in Corinthians, he'd say, this is not me, but the Lord. What he meant was, I'm writing this with my hand and there's no Old Testament precedent for what I'm writing. But while he was writing that, the Holy Ghost had a hold of his hand, making his scripture. And that, that, don't that beat all? I mean, there's never been a book like this book. You say, well, the men wrote the Bible so it ain't perfect. God inspired them so it is perfect. It has a human element and a divine element. It's the written word has two natures, human and divine. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you this morning, brother, there ain't never been a book like the Bible. It started out like our Bible right here. In 1604, uh, King James gave the decree for the translation of the Scriptures into English. You know, I, I told you to you throughout all this, you should get that and listen to it every once in a while. Still celebrating the 400th anniversary. So King James gave the authority in 1604. Took seven years for it to be put together. Fifty-four some odd uh, scholars and their field were given the job of translating. 
They each had a certain portion of the scripture that they worked on. They would meet every few weeks and compare them with each other. Then they would go back and work on their section. Then they would go back and compare them. It wasn't like they was getting paid big money for it. Uh, they were threatened life. During this time, the Catholics tried to blow up King James and the castle. So it wasn't popular. It wasn't like, boy, we're all going to get rich. It was like we might get killed for this. See, there's a difference in that and the way they're making these new Bibles today. And they, the Catholics tried, they called it the gunpowder plot in 1605. But listen to this. In 1607, the colonists arrived in Jamestown, Virginia and called it Jamestown, by the way, uh, the first colony here in America. And it was during the time the King James Bible was being put together, which means that King James of England was the founding monarch of the United States of America and they called that colony Jamestown. Isn't that something? You know what James means? Jacob. It means like Israel. That's God's hand on the work. And in 1611, the authorized version was published and it is, as you've heard me say, the greatest book this world has ever seen. It had a divine nature and it has a human nature and it was God putting it together. Let me say secondly this morning, Jesus Christ was and is perfect and without fault. Jesus Christ was and is perfect and without fault. There is nothing wrong with Him. You might find something wrong with me. It's easy to do. I can find something wrong with you. That's easy to do. You can find something wrong with our building here. You can find something wrong with our, with our pews, with our song, with our choir. You can find something wrong with everything in here. But you will not find nothing wrong with Him. And He's perfect. He is perfect. They searched Him. They looked over Him with a magnifying glass. And Pilate said, I find no fault in Him. He's perfect. He never took one step that He shouldn't have taken. He never said one word that He shouldn't have spoken. He never made one uh, uh, gesture that wasn't right. Uh, we, we're, we're human. We're frail. We fail every day. But I'm telling you, thank God He lived a perfect sinless life. The Bible said, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You know, I got to thinking this morning about going to hell. And I got to thinking about how glad I'm not going to hell and I'm not going to burn. And I'm not going to burn because his perfect life was placed on my record. And I'm going to heaven when I die because of a perfect Savior that lived a perfect life. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they saw him, they never saw him take a step out of line. They never heard him utter a word that wasn't from perfect lips with a perfect heart. He was perfect and is. Now, you know where I'm going, don't you? If Jesus Christ was and is perfect, the Bible is also was and is perfect. If you don't believe we got a perfect Bible, you can't, how you don't believe we got a perfect Savior? Amen? If there's something wrong with the Bible, there might be something wrong with the Savior. But I'm glad there's nothing wrong with the Bible. I find no fault in the Bible. I trust it. I believe it. I believe it where it speaks of the, of the past, of the future. And you know, as you've heard me say, uh, uh, there's, people, there's people who thought the Bible, you know, there was a time when every scientist in the world thought the earth was flat. Scientists believed the earth was flat. They was wrong. The Bible is right. It said he sits on the circle of the earth. Way back in the Old Testament, uh, before there was a telescope, before there was a trip to outer space and look back on the globe, before there was any of that stuff, the Bible was right. The Bible talks about back in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about Leviticus 17, about the life of the flesh being in the blood. Do you understand that up until 1800s, they, people thought that diseases was in your blood and when you get sick, they would, they would cut you and bleed you to try to get rid of diseases? That's what they believed. That's what doctors believed. Up until 150 years ago, they believed that you're diseased. And by the way, that's how George Washington died. They bled him to death. They thought, well, we can get this blood out. It'll make him up. They killed the man. Now, I'm going to tell you this morning, the Bible said in Leviticus that the life of the flesh is in the blood. 
And the Bible tells about, the Bible talks about running water. Did you know for years and years and years, they thought that if you just washed your hands, that they'd be clean? And that Bible said back in Leviticus, let it go through running water. They didn't even understand what germs were. They didn't know that germs were so little you couldn't see them. So they thought if you washed your hands, it's clean. But the Bible said running water. Science catches up about every 2,000 years a little bit of what the book said. The Bible was and is perfect. The Bible was and is perfect. Did you know the oldest book in the world, the book of Job, said that he hangeth the earth upon nothing. That means outer space. There's nothing under it. There's no big chains holding it up. He hangeth the earth upon nothing. How's that for a perfect book? I'm glad, thank God, that the Bible was and is perfect. If you're looking for fault, you won't find it in the Bible. I'm glad we got a Bible that said Jesus was the Son of God. I'm glad Luke 2.33 in the King James Bible said that Mary was his mother, but Joseph was not his father, like the modern versions say. I'm glad we got a book that said God in 1 Timothy 3.16 was manifest in the flesh. I'm glad we've got a book that says in John, 1 John 5, that it's the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Bible is perfect and without fault. Listen, you go to find fault with the Bible, you go to find fault with the Lord. Number three, Jesus is hated by some and loved by others. And that's truth. Even at his birth, Herod tried to kill him. As soon as he got here, they started hating him. Old King Herod, they found out. Now he's, he's several months old by this time, maybe, but the King Herod sent them guys to kill every baby under two years old. He said, I want him dead. I hate him. I hate him. I've never, I've never, I've never even met him. I've never even seen him, but I want that baby dead. He felt threatened by him. He didn't, he, he felt scared of him. They said he's born king of the Jews. He said he's not going to grow up and deliver these people. He said, get rid of him. Get rid of him. We don't want him. Get rid of him. We don't want him. They hated him. But yet at the same time, there were shepherds bowing down and saying glory to God in the highest and worshiping him. He was hated by some. He was loved by others. He had people there that beat nails in his hands and went bow. Wow. and hated him and spit in his face and he had others worshiping him saying thou art the son of God he's hated by some and loved by others now let me tell you something about preachers preachers are supposed to be the same way you better watch out for a preacher that everybody likes and everybody loves he's supposed to be hated by some and loved by others every bible preacher in that bible they, they, the world either hates him or the people love him and it's one of the two. There ain't no little uh, mealy mouth compromiser where everybody likes. I'm telling you this morning, Jesus was hated by some and loved by others. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, they hated him. I read about, I read about uh, Rachel Scott, that little girl at Columbine High School, 14 years old, teenagers. And them boys went to Columbine High School to them, them machine, uh, the automatic rifles. And they started shooting people and them, them boys knew them kids and they knew Rachel was a Christian. And she got down like this and they held a gun over her and said, do you love Jesus? And she said, yes, I do. And they said, well, go see him then and blew her brains out. Her family and them, they have talks in some of the high schools and colleges about Rachel Scott. She is a modern day martyr. She was a 14 year old girl that says he loved me, I love him, I'd rather die than the nine, and they took her life. This didn't just happen in the old centuries. This didn't just happen. Ladies and gentlemen, that little girl loved him enough when it come to it to die rather than deny him. What about that? And then little Brian Warner has a concert and all these Satanists come. He calls himself Marilyn Manson, but he's named Brian Warner. Ha, ha, ha. Little Briny Whiny, who's jealous of the Lord Jesus and his power, takes a Bible and rips it up and throws it in the crowd. Jesus is hated by some and loved by others. 
The Bible is hated by some and loved by others. Listen, I don't know if this is doing in your heart what it did in my heart, but I'm telling you, I don't see how you can just sit there. I'm telling you, I thought, he's hated by some, he's loved by others. The Bible's the same way. There's people that hate that book right there. They do not, They despise that book right there. And there's people that love that book right there. Listen, there's people that love this book right here. Uh, I'm telling you, they'll hold on to it till death do they part. And brother, there's people that hate it. They'll throw it out of motel rooms. They'll They'll rip it up. They'll burn it. When they get a Gideon Bible, they burn Bibles. They've destroyed Bibles. They hate the Bible. But if the Bible is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why they said, oh, um, Ingersoll, the famous atheist Ingersoll held up a copy of the Bible. He said, in 15 years, I'll have this book in the morgue. He said, it'll be dead. Guess what? When the 15 years went by, Ingersoll's in the morgue and the Bible was doing just fine. They said, oh, Voltaire, Voltaire, the famous atheist, he said in 100 years, the Bible would be an outmoded and forgotten book only to be found in museums. When the 100 years were up, Voltaire's house was owned and used to print copies of the Bible and put out the Word of God. Say amen right there. Oh, Hume, the atheist said, he said, I think I see the end of Christianity, like John Lennon. I see the twilight of Christianity. And he died, and the Auxiliary Bible Society of Edinburgh had their first meeting in the room that Hume died and went to hell in. I'm telling you, this book is hated by some, but it is loved by others. It's that old book right there that the saints get that's a, that's a, that when they're claiming victory for your kids it's that book right there that'll bring your kids to their problems it's that book right there that'll save us from our worries and our fear it's that book right there that you grab well listen when you're dying it's that book right there brother that's the book it's hated by some but it's loved by others it, it has it has those natures about it hallelujah I heard about a man went to the flea market and all these guys from the church was going to go to the flea market and pass out tracts and give out tracts and be a witness of what some of us, some of the young people plan on doing Friday night. And he, he went over there to give out tracts and witness and he's supposed to meet his buddies over at the flea market and the guy pulls his Bible out of the back seat and puts it in a brown paper bag and walks across the flea market like this. Scared to death somebody going to see him carrying a Bible. Brown bag in his Bible, man. Scared somebody going to catch him with it. What would have been wrong with him just grabbing it? and just walk? What's wrong with just walking across it? He say, I can't believe that. Would you do it? Y'all go with us Friday night. Go with us Friday night. We'll meet up here. We'll go, we're going down to Charlotte, over to Asheville somewhere, and you'll stand out on the street. Don't be, if you're ashamed of that, you're ashamed of him. You're ashamed of that Bible. You're ashamed of Jesus Christ. I know that kind of preaching ain't popular. I know it. But good night in the morning, people. Why would you be ashamed of the greatest book? Lay it on your desk at work. Take it to work. Carry a copy of it in your car with you when you go on the trip. And take it with you on vacation. And read it every night with your family. Your attitude toward that shows your attitude toward Him. Number four. Jesus saves you and gives you the new birth. The Bible said in 1 Peter 2.25, He bare our sins. The Bible said in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ, see, Jesus is who saves us and gives us the new birth. We are saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now, so the Bible. The Bible saves us and gives us the new birth. You say, now preacher, you're, you're edging on idolatry there saying the Bible, I'll have you know, before you get too jumpy there, you better remember that scripture, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. You're born again by that incorruptible seed laying right there. You're born again by Jesus and you're born again by the Bible. That's why it said you've got to hear it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You say, well, does man have to hear the Word of God to be saved? Yes. 
Yes. If that's true, yes. Yes. You can't be born again except by the Word of God. Amen. Now that makes people, the question comes up, well, you mean somebody have to tell you have a King James Bible? No. You can get saved by reading a track, but it's got to have the Word of God in it. Somewhere, somehow, someplace, that word got to go in here or in here and get in you. That's what you're born again of, the Word of God. Amen. Say amen. amen. I'm telling you this morning, you are born again by the Lord Jesus Christ. You are born again by this book right here. Let me say, number five, Jesus is a living Savior and ever liveth. He conquered death. He's alive right now. He is not dead. He told the disciples. He said, well, he's walking down the road one day. He appeared to them after the resurrection. He said, why are you guys so sad? And they said, because hadn't you heard what happened? Jesus died and and we thought he was going to be the one that that delivered us. And he started expounding the scripture. He wasn't dead. He was alive. alive. And then they said, that's you. And he disappeared just like that. By the time you think you've got him, he'll just... Move out of the way, you know. That's the way the Lord does you. So you can't get too cocky on yourself. And I'm going to tell you something, brother. Listen, He is alive and ever liveth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is alive and ever liveth. The Word of God is quick. That means alive. Powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. They're so close. Jesus Christ and that Bible is so close that the way you feel toward one shows how you feel toward the other. The way you look at one shows how you look at the other. The way you respect one shows how you respect the other. I've had people tell me, so I'm a Christian, but I never read the Bible. Well, you're not much of a Christian. I'm not saying you ain't saved, but I'm saying there's something wrong with your life somewhere because He is the living Word. There is the written Word. And if you don't love that book, you don't love Him. You say, well, the Bible's boring. I'd watch my mouth if I was you. That's the most exciting book in the world when you know the author and it gets real to you. I tell you what your problem is. You've got so much of the devil's candy and the world's stuff that the Bible seems boring anymore to you. That's something y'all going to have to work on. Six, and I'm done. Jesus Christ will someday judge the world. For it says, all judgment God committed under the sun. You said the Bible's going to judge the world? Yep. Jesus will one day judge the world. So will the Bible. He said, the words that I speak unto you, the same will judge you in the last days. I got news for you. When you die, you're not going to be judged by your neighbor. You're not going to go up there and say, well, I've done better than he did. That's not the standard. God ain't going to put, he ain't going to put all your good things on one side of the scale and all your bad stuff on the other side of the scale and just whichever way ways must that be which way you go and he ain't going to put your wife your husband on and say well you did better than they did he's going to put you on one side and Jesus on the other side he's perfect you're a sinner you're going down and you're going to judge by that book thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal it doesn't matter the world's standards don't matter Congress voting that marriage can be a man and a man don't marry. Congress voting that we no longer believe that it's a, a sin. What about? See, we're not going to be judged by Congress laws. The book. The book's what you'll be judged by. The book's what you'll be judged by. I read this the other day, not long ago. I'm going to give it to you and I'm through. What if the Lord came this week? What if the Lord came this week? Somebody put it like this. This isn't exactly the way it will be, but you get the point. It was the night before Jesus came, and all through the house, not a creature was praying, not one in our house. Our Bibles were laid on the shelf without care in hopes that Jesus would not come here. The children were dressing to crawl into bed, not once ever kneeling or bowing a head. And mom in her rocker with a baby on her lap was watching the late show while I took a nap. When out of the north there arose such a clatter, I sprang to my feet to see what was the matter. 
Away to the window I flew like a flash to open the shutters and threw up the sash. Then what to my wondering eyes should appear but angels proclaiming that Jesus was here. With a light like the sun sending forth a bright ray, I knew in a moment this must be the day. The light of his face made me cover my head. It was Jesus returning, just like he said. And though I possessed worldly wisdom and wealth, I cried when I saw him in spite of myself. The book of life which he held in his hand was written the name of every saved man. He spoke not a word as he searched for my name. When he said, it's not here, I hung my head in shame. The people whose names he had written with love, he gathered to take them to his Father above. With those who were ready, he rose without sound. When all the rest of us just are standing around. I fell to my knees, but it was too late. I'd waited too long and seal my fate. I stood and I cried as they rose out of sight. Oh God, if we'd only been ready tonight. In the words of this poem, the meaning is clear. The coming of Jesus surely is near. There's only one life, and when it comes to the last call, we'll find out the Bible was right after all. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one's moving. Every head bowed and every eye's closed. No talking, no moving. I want to ask you a question this morning. If Jesus came today, would you, my friend, would you be ready, my friend? Oh, no, preacher, but I'm young and I've got plenty of time. You don't know that. You don't know that. You really don't. Young man was killed just this week up in our town. You don't know. You just don't know. You just don't know. I wonder this morning, while heads are bowed and eyes, some's already coming. I wonder this morning, how many here would say, preacher, I know my attitude toward the Lord and toward the Bible ain't right. I need to get down there this morning. I need to make things right. The Word made flesh. That's what Christmas is all about. The Word made flesh. Will you let the Lord help you this morning? Just come on. Just get down on your knee. Your attitude toward your Bible shows your attitude toward God. Come on. Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. Come on. Just get out of your seat. If you're here this morning, you're not right with God. You're not saved. Come on. Come on right now. Be a man. Be a man about it. Be a man about it. Be a woman about it. Would you come? Lord, please speak to hearts this morning. Please, Lord Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost, come down, do a mighty, mighty work. Oh, God, do a work in these hearts. Of young men, young women, boys and girls here today. Touch us, oh, God, we ask. Help us to go out of here on fire for you, living for you and doing right. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Let's sing this morning. Let's sing while others are coming. Just get out of your seat. Come on, let's pray right now. Come on. Come on. I am without Amen. That's right. Come on. Amen. Come on now. And that thou bids me come to thee, land Amen. Let's sing, everybody. Help the man sing. Come on, y'all. Just, Just as I am waiting on to rid my soul of one dark one. Will you come this morning? Come on right now. Come on.